nearly 50 years ago, we started research on cannabis and surprisingly, we were one of the very few groups in the world that did research on this topic and the reasons could have been legal. Many departments of chemistry and biology and in the universities uh, could not go ahead doing research in this field because of the legal aspects. And uh, we were surprised to find out when we started work in this field that the active compound in uh, cannabis, in marijuana, in hashish, had never been isolated in pure form and uh, therefore people could not use it in the fields of biochemistry or biology because it was just not available. And modern science requires exact amounts. One cannot say we took cannabis for research. One has to say we took a certain amount of a particular compound in order to do research. And therefore there was essentially no research in uh, biochemistry or pharmacology and essentially no research in the clinical sciences. Well, once we identified THC and elucidated its structure and synthesized it, <coughs> it became possible to use cannabis and then within our lab in collaboration with many biological labs and to a certain extent in collaboration with clinical labs, we started uh, expanding the work in uh, numerous fields. Uh, many additional groups uh, at the Hebrew University and uh, in other universities in Israel went into that field. And uh, so today, for example, we have uh, nearly 20 groups within our school, within our university, that work on cannabinoids. And there is a collaboration between all these groups so we can advance uh, the field uh, uh, much more than we expected, actually. Being in the field for nearly 50 years, obviously we have contact with many, most of the groups that have been doing research in cannabis or still doing research in cannabis throughout the world, whether it's in Europe, it may be in uh, uh, Spain, in Italy, in Germany, in France, and um, there is a lot of collaboration going on. <coughs> many of our research projects are in collaboration with uh, groups, whether they are in Israel or abroad. And the reason for that is that this is a wide field in which there are uh, many aspects. Uh, my laboratory is uh, essentially a chemical lab, lab working in collaboration with uh, labs in whatever uh, aspect we're working at the moment. So, uh, uh, to give you an example, on uh, head injury, we have done a lot of work with Professor uh, Esther Shohami. She's a pharmacologist working on uh, head injury. So, together, we have shown that many of the cannabinoids are effective. Now, one of the uh, major developments uh, within our lab, in collaboration with, uh, with others, was the discovery of compounds present in our body, in our brain, uh, that uh, are the chemical basis of an endocannabinoid system. Uh, THC in the plant mimics the activity of these compounds, anandamide and 2-AG. So we found that one of these endogenous compounds, 2-AG, is uh, a protective agent after a uh, closed head injury. Uh, Professor Shohami tried uh, uh, to show this by uh, <coughs> causing a minor injury, minor head injury to mice. And uh, then we gave these mice to AG, one of the endocannabinoids. And indeed, we saw that the endocannabinoids lower the damage. So this is the type of work we're doing with uh, many other groups. For example, in epilepsy. Uh, many years ago, we found that uh, cannabidiol, a non-psychoactive component of cannabis, uh, uh, lowers the epilepsy attacks in mice. So we thought it might be a good idea to try this in uh, humans. And after quite a lot of work, it, uh, it was possible to do it. We did the chemistry, we isolated a huge amount of cannabidiol 
almost half a kilo of cannabidiol, which was sent to South America, and they tried it on patients. And it was uh, a small experiment. We had 15 patients, eight got CBD, high doses, uh, seven were the placebos, and we showed that in those patients that were not being helped very well by the existing drugs, cannabidiol in half of them almost completely blocked their, their epilepsy attacks, and three of the others uh, uh, were, uh, had uh, much less. Uh, so here we showed that cannabidiol is an anti-epileptic drug. Now, over the last couple of years, this has been accepted by a huge amount of uh, people, in particularly in pediatric epilepsy. And now in Israel, it is uh, legal to administer cannabidiol from cannabis, extracts of cannabis containing cannabidiol, uh, and um, this has been successful in many types of pediatric epilepsy, uh, basically about 60% of the children are uh, uh, helped to a large extent by cannabidiol. So these are two uh, uh, different, uh, completely different uh, uh, types of work that we're doing. But we're also continuing our basic work, trying to find out the basis of cannabinoid action. And it has turned out that there uh, that in addition to the compounds that we make in our body, and we call one of these compounds anandamide, uh, there are mm, almost 150 compounds which are chemically closely related, although they do not bind to the cannabinoid receptors. And one of these compounds, for example, is formed in the body in uh, cases of osteoporosis bone damage, which uh, comes after, uh, in almost all women after the age of 55, because of hormonal changes. Uh, we found that, uh, in mice at least, uh, one of these compounds is a very potent anti-osteoporotic agent. So here we have, again, a development from the cannabinoid system. These compounds are closely related to the endogenous compound, to the compounds we make in our body and that are essentially cannabinoids. These additional compounds, very closely related to anandamide, to the endogenous cannabinoids, but have completely different actions. So uh, these are the several types of advances that we are uh, involved in. And again, I want to stress, it is done in collaboration with a huge number of colleagues. Uh, and uh, this has made possible the advancing, the advance of uh, uh, the cannabinoid uh, science, if you wish, uh, in many directions. Many of the drugs that come from nature, the natural products, uh, do not reach the market after several years but as derivatives. For example, you cannot go to a pharmacy and buy penicillin. It doesn't exist as a drug. One can get derivatives of penicillin, which are one way or another better than the original compound. Or there are compounds like a, a hormone that we produce, corticosterone. One cannot buy a cortisone in a drug. So we can buy a derivative of cortisone, which is in many respects better than uh, uh, the original natural product. Well, this may happen with cannabinoids as well. It has not happened yet, but it may happen in the next 10 or 15 years. Compounds are produced that uh, are semi-synthetic. Namely, one takes one of the compounds present in cannabis, cannabidiol, and makes a derivative. Now, cannabidiol is an excellent compound, but in some diseases, like in schizophrenia, one has to use amounts of nearly 800 milligrams per day. These are huge amounts. And maybe there can be compounds that are more active, and then one can use lower amounts and see if anything 
better effects. And indeed, we have seen that one of our compounds, uh, cannabidiol with a fluorine atom, which is in this case a semi-synthetic compound, uh, is better <coughs> in several aspects, in anxiety, in depression, in schizophrenia, but all this has been done so far in animals models alone, not in uh, humans because we have not reached that stage. And this work, this particular aspect has been done with uh, colleagues in Sao Paulo in Brazil. You ask about uh, med the difference so, between the medical cannabis and recreational cannabis. This, these two aspects should be completely separated. Medical cannabis has to be developed on the basis of where we stand in medicine. Namely, we should look at the side effects, we should look at the toxicity, if any, we should look at the doses needed for a particular disease, and all this should be done under supervision of people that are involved in, in medicine. So, recreational cannabis is something else entirely. Recreational cannabis is a social issue. If in a country, society decides that cannabis is uh, free to be used, then it will be used no matter of what happens with medical cannabis. These are two completely different aspects, and I don't think that uh, the people should come over and say, we want recreational cannabis because it is good in medicine. These should not be mixed. Medicine is based on medical aspects. Recreational uh, cannabis is a social issue, two different uh, uh, in, uh, developments in the field of cannabis. Well, you ask, uh, what do I see with cannabis in the future? Well, recreational cannabis, as I said, is a social issue, and uh, uh, it depends on the number of people that are using it. Probably the numbers will go, and uh, we shall see more and more people using cannabis throughout the world, and the governments have to decide whether to uh, have completely free use of cannabis or not. Again, this is political, social issue, has to be decided, and... Uh, probably, if it is decided to open completely the market, governments or the ministries of health will have to decide on the, on the level of THC, because in some countries the level of THC available has become so high that uh, the side effects are uh, too potent. But this is a social issue. The medical issue is, as I said before, completely different, and there will be many developments uh, in this field, for example, it has been shown that cannabidiol is a very potent drug in the field of autoimmune diseases. These are diseases in which the body attacks itself. We don't know uh, in most cases why the body does that, but it's something that happens. For example, in pediatric diabetes, it's called diabetes type 1, the body attacks the cells that produce insulin and many of, the, of these cells are damaged or even destroyed. So, uh, it has been found that in many of these autoimmune diseases, cannabidiol is very helpful. So, I see that, uh, I think, I cannot predict, but I think that within the next five years, ten years, maybe a little bit more, cannabidiol, all derivatives of cannabidiol, will start to be employed in... Uh, autoimmune diseases, which and we know today that there are many dozens of autoimmune diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, for example, and I believe that here we can see very, very uh, uh, helpful advances, and maybe within 10 years we'll have numerous cannabinoid drugs in the market for a variety of diseases, autoimmune disease, schizophrenia, and so on.